we've been writing tests, we've written unit tests, we've written integration tests, we've worked with code coverage information, and everything that we've done so far has been local such that we have a really simple way to say npm test and with you know with one command we can go through and make sure that all of our code is working the way that we expect it to. This is fantastic. Now, the next piece of the puzzle is we want to be able to run these tests all the time. So every time we make a change, we want the test to be run and we want to make sure they're passing. Every time somebody sends us a pull request, we want to run these tests and make sure that it's passing. So what we want to do is we want to use the tests like a safety net. We've, we've put all this time and effort into creating our tests. What we want to do now is we want to make robots that run them for us all the time so that we don't have to worry that nobody's going to go and break something that we've already done. So we have a, we have a lot of options. There's all kinds of what are called CI solutions. Uh, so CI stands for continuous integration, meaning that we want to continually not just write code, somebody changes this, somebody changes this. We want to take those changes and we always want to integrate everything back together again, like compile the code, run the tests, make sure everything works and do this all the time. We don't want to, we don't want to integrate once every month. Everybody goes off and does their own thing and once a month we get together and discover that the whole program's broken. That's no good. So every time we make a change, we want to do this. So we need a system that lets us continually do that. And so a lot of these are called pipelines or they have this concept that your, you know, your code is kind of flowing through these states. So there's a bunch of them that we could use. So the one I'm gonna focus on is GitHub Actions, but you could also use CircleCI, Azure Pipelines, Travis CI. There's a lot of different ones that are out there. I'm gonna focus on, I'm gonna focus on how to do this with GitHub Actions because it's we're in GitHub already, it's really simple to use. At least it's simple to get started with. So this is not going to be a comprehensive review of everything you can do with uh, GitHub Actions. I myself am still learning about them. They're fairly new, and I don't I don't pretend to understand all the different pieces of it. But I want to show you how to get going at it, and they make it pretty easy for you to integrate it into your into your project. Okay, so what we have here is we have our project, it's already built, our package.json has a way, like the standard way that a node project runs a set of tests with the test script. We have a standard way to install things with npm install, we've listed all of our dependencies. So we've got our project set up in a way that it's like a common way to run a node project. And if you're working in Python, you would wanna do the same thing for a common Python setup. Same thing for Java, same thing for Go, all the different languages. They have different package managers, they have different script uh, configurations that they expect, best practices that people use. So if you follow those, your program can be run at, inside of a GitHub action. So what you have when you are in any one of your repos, you have this actions tab at the top of GitHub. And if you click on actions, what it'll do is it'll let you set up a workflow for this repository. So it will suggest workflows automatically for you. So because I'm in a node project, it says, well, you could set up the node.js workflow or you could set up a workflow to publish this um, as a package, or you could also set up various deployment workflows. Like if I wanted to deploy this to the cloud, I want to deploy it to Amazon or I want to deploy it to Google Cloud or something like that. All of these different workflows are there and there's hundreds and hundreds of these different workflows and they're, they're, they're kind of like scripts essentially or things that you can do like stages that you can go through with a build. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to do the Node.js workflow because that's what my project is and when you're in your project, have a look at the suggested ones. You can also set up one for yourself. So what happens when you click on set up this workflow, what it's gonna do is it's gonna make a new file. So inside of the .github folder, inside of the workflows directory, it's gonna make a node.js.yaml file. So if you haven't worked with YAML before, YAML is a configuration file format that looks like this. And it's pretty easy to learn. 
and it's used all over the place for configuration, for cloud computing and serverless and all sorts of things. YAML is just the standard. So it's a good thing for you to, to get used to it, have a look at it and um, you know get used to, to how it would work. At the top here, it gives me a link to the documentation for setting up a node project in GitHub Actions. And if you're working in a different, if you're not in Node, you're in Python or something like that, you're gonna get the same uh, set of um, documentation, but for the language that you're in. Okay, so let's see what we have here. So I have a name for this workflow, Node.js CI. And the next thing that it does is it specifies when this workflow is gonna be triggered. So, Essentially what GitHub is going to do, GitHub, GitHub is literally a hub. So you have all kinds of things coming in and it's the central point on this. So think about it. you got pull requests coming in, people filing issues, people making comments on things, people starring repositories, people adding pages to wikis. All of those things are coming into GitHub and GitHub is aware of them. And so you can write code that happens in response to those things happening. So this says, on a push to the main branch, we want to run this. Or on a pull request to the main branch, we want to run this. So this is really good because it means that if somebody sends me a pull request, it's going to run what I'm about to build. Or if I or somebody else who has access merges something into the master or pushes something to master, it's automatically going to run this. So this is great because it means that anyone sending a pull request is automatically going to have this run. Or if I do it myself, it's also going to run. So it's going to cover all of those different cases. So you could, if you had other branches in here, you know, you could list other branches that you also want this to be triggered on. But for the case of what I'm doing here, I'm only interested in having it happen on these, you know, for these two branches. Okay, the next thing is I have uh, a build job. The build job is going to run on Ubuntu. Now, if you want to, um, you can run this on any operating system that you want. So if you run it, if you want to run it on Windows, you would say Windows latest, or you would say Mac OS latest. So what GitHub has is they have servers or VMs that are racked, and you're getting to run your code on a machine. Um, so here, this, you know, here, if you wanted to, this could be um, more than one of these things. Like if you wanted to have um, more than one, but I'm, I don't care about this happening on multiple machines because I'm running a node app. I'm happy for it to just run on Ubuntu. So this is going to run on the Linux. The next thing that I have here is I have a matrix for all of the different versions of node that it's going to run against. So I'm using as aspects of node that I know were written uh, only after I think node 14. Um, if I look up node FS, I think that the promises API that I'm using, uh, it was added in, let's see, this API is, ex is accessible. Okay, version 10. So that means that I should be good from 10, 10 onward um, or 10, let's try, let's, we'll, we'll give it a try and see how it goes here. So this is saying, 10, 12, and 14. So that's good. So if I wanted to add 15, I could. So it's going to try running on Ubuntu using all three of these different versions of Node. So when you're writing code and you want to make sure it works on Windows with Node 10, Windows with Node 12, Windows with Node 14, Linux with Node 10, Linux. So you can see how you could very quickly have this whole matrix of builds that you're going to be, you're going to be working on. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bunch of actions that have already been written by other people. So there's a checkout action, which is going to check out the code that uh, is in my repository onto this machine so that it can run it. There's another one that's going to set up the version of Node here. So it's going to set up the version of Node for each one of these different uh, versions that are in the build matrix. And then what it's going to do is it's going to run these steps. So it's going to do npm ci, which is like a clean install. So it's going to install all the dependencies. It's going to do npm run build if present. I don't have a build step, so I'm just going to get rid of that. And then it's going to do npm test. So what you could do here is if you had to compile your code, 
you could compile your code and then you could run your tests, like any of the steps that you have to do. Or if you needed to install other special dependencies, in the docs, there's ways for you to install whatever you might need, some kind of a service, a database, something that you need to test against, or you need a special version of a library, some other thing that's, you know, you need some component of Linux to be there, some component of Windows to be there. So you would do all of that. And essentially what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm using code, I'm using YAML to define like what the environment is gonna be like. Like I am declaratively stating I want this version of Node, this version of Linux, I want to do this, I want to check out the code, I want to install the dependencies, I want to run the tests. It's going to do all of those things in order and then it's going to report back on it. So this is amazing because I don't have to provision any of these machines, I don't have to set it up and maintain them, that's all going to happen for me automatically. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this file and I'm, I'm going to, I, if I want to, I can actually commit it directly on the main branch like this. So, you know, um, add, add GitHub actions workflow. And this is gonna be uh, so that I can uh, run node tests in GitHub actions. So I'm going to commit this directly onto the main branch and I will commit that here. And so now I have a new file sitting in this directory, node.js.yml, and it's been put into, into this here. Now, if I go to actions, you'll see that this has kicked off a build and it's building this commit. If I open this up, you'll see that I have three different builds that are happening right now. So here's build on 10x, 12x, 14x. So let's look at 12x. So you can see what's happening is it is currently installing my dependencies, and now you see it's about to run the tests. So here it's running the tests. All of the tests passed. It's cleaning up and it's finished. So you can see that this workflow, if I go back, let me refresh this. All three of these jobs succeeded. All of them passed, everything worked. So this is amazing. So that, that's great. So let's test this out. So I'm gonna pull, because I just landed that on the main branch, I'm gonna pull um, from the main branch here so that I get this workflow file. And if I, um, I now have um, a GitHub folder with a workflows directory and inside there is Node.js, so uh, GitHub, workflows node and there's my file the file that's controlling how i do this so if i ever want to make changes all i have to do is i have to uh, modify this modify this file push it back up in another commit and it will it will allow me to do this so let's make a change to the code and look let's see what a pull request would do so i'm going to check out a new branch um testing um actions PR and let's make a change to uh, let's make a change to the code so let's go to um, well let's just keep this error processing URI I'm trying to think of a simple change that I could make that's not gonna, uh, let's just change this to lowercase, invalid URL, like this. I'm gonna save this, uh, git diff. So I've changed uppercase URL to lowercase URL. I'm going to um, do a quick test. I wanna make sure that my tests are okay locally. Everything's good there. So I'm going to um, add lib URL. I'm gonna commit and I'm gonna change the uh, error message for invalid URLs. And I'm gonna push this up, git push origin testing actions PR. So here, 
let's go and create uh, my PR. So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna make this change. This change alters the way that we display an error message when a U message when a URL is invalid using lowercase. So I've got a, like a very basic change to the code. I'm gonna create this pull request. So now what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna have right away, you can see that three different builds popped up. So inside of this pull request, I have those like, now these are, in, these are currently in progress. So if I click on any of these details, I can come over here and I can see this thing running. So this is the code that I just wrote that I pushed up. I want to merge this in, but this is going to, um, it's going to get tested to make sure that all of these work. So let's just let this run. So it says all three checks have passed. All of these things are good like this. Now imagine if we, imagine if we changed this around. So let's say that I commented out this code like that. And uh, let's make sure that this actually breaks. No, so that's fascinating. So that means that I don't have enough test coverage. See how easy it is to break your own code? Uh, let's find another way to break this. Uh, let's return the empty string. That should break it. Yeah, okay, so that breaks a bunch of tests. So what I'm gonna do, just to show you what would happen, is I'm gonna add uh, libURL. Um, testing a change that breaks the tests. And I'm gonna push this up to my uh, testing actions PR. So that's gonna get received over here and you can see that it's going to, in a second, it's gonna trigger a build. So these are gonna, they're gonna build again. We can watch one of them happen here. So this one, for example. So here come the tests. You can see it already failing. And uh, this has failed. So now let's go back here and you'll see that two, two of them have failed. This one got canceled because the other ones have failed. So it's just given up. So now I have a green check mark next to this commit here and I have a red check mark next to this. What's great about this is that if I'm reviewing this code, I can go and click on any of these. So I can click on details here and I can go and I can figure out why it's failing. So like all of the logs for the failure are here. So I can see that they're there and that's this is what's happening. Now, obviously I can fix this by returning response.body like this. So let's go back and let's say, okay, I realize I've made a silly mistake. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna amend my commit and overwrite the other one. So I'm gonna say get status Okay, git add lib url uh, url.js. Git commit, actually, no, I'll make a new commit. Git commit m uh, fixing failed tests. Git push origin testing. Okay, we go back. So it's received a third commit. First one passed, second one failed. This one hasn't started yet. This one's gonna get queued up.
waiting for these to build. This Good, so this one's green and we can wait for all three of them to go green. So what's nice is I know that it's green. I know on Linux in these three different configurations, it's working, all the checks have passed and now I have this merge pull request button come up. I could decide, okay, yeah, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take this PR or I'm not gonna take this PR depending on uh, what I wanna do. So let's say that I wanted to merge this in. So I'm going to uh, merge this into the main branch. And when I do this, so let's merge it. Confirm, merge. Now, if I go back to actions, you'll see that this has triggered another one because I'm merging this pull request. And we said that every time Every time we merge on master or push to master, every time we do a pull request against, or in main rather, every time we do a pull request against main, it's going to trigger this workflow. So it's like an extra level of, you know, just to be careful, we're saying, all right, make sure that the pull request is good. But then if somebody makes a mistake and they merge this, it's gonna report back and say, well, this actually broke it. So now we're gonna have some indication when we go back and look at the history of what's gone on here, we're gonna be able to see the history of all of the different branches, all of the different commits, who did it, when they did it, and we can go and we can see at any time I could click on one of these and I could say, all right, I wanna see what the problem was here and it'll give me back the log. So I still have access to all of this information so that I can see exactly what's happening inside of the history of my project. I have all of this uh, history, but I also know exactly what's going on for every pull request, for every push that's happening all the time that we go through. So working with um, GitHub Actions and, and setting up these workflows for your repository, incredibly powerful. And I would you know, encourage you to look around at other CI solutions too. GitHub can be connected to lots of other external, you don't have to do it all through GitHub, you can use other uh, services to be able to uh, run various kinds of tools. So we've been talking about running things like ESLint or linting tools or running unit tests. Uh, running your compiler, running fuzz testing, running like all kinds of things can be run inside of these of these workflows. Super powerful, something you definitely want to play with and get working for your own projects.